Épidémie, la disparition répétée d'ordinateurs, de journalistes travaillant sur le Hello and welcome to the Crossing Europe Festival TV. Our team of 12 participants from Slovenia, Romania, Austria and France will provide you with the latest news from the ongoing festival. Today we will present you a small preview of the ret retrospective of Flipped Austrian Flipbook Festival. Afterwards we have a report of the nightside film Sequestrados, kidnapped by Miguel Ángel Vivas and an interview with Markus Koichnik, curator of the nightside category. For our live show, three guests will be joining us on set, all of them directors in different categories. Luis Calter with Cara Cremada, Michael Madsen into Eternity and Mark Davistu with Yes We Are. Thank you for watching and enjoy the show. The first edition of the Austrian Flipbook Festival Flipped launched on Wednesday night. Featuring a retrospective of the submitted works during Crossing Europe Festival, here is a sneak preview of the exhibit. Welcome to the second live discussion of Crossing Europe Film Festival TV show. Today our guests are Michael Madsen, uh, Magda Wistub and Louis Galter. These three films seem pretty different at first, but actually they're all linked to Resistance in various ways. For example, Michael Madsen who made the film Inter Eternity about the first, the world first, uh, nuclear waste storage in Finland and Magda Vistupu made a very interesting film about the lesbian community in Poland. And the movie Cara Cremada of Luis Galter attempts to uh, reflect on the resistance against Franco's regime with the figure of um, Ramon Villa. So now let's watch the excerpt of Cara Cremada. You used to be not in that interested into history. What made you choose that historical topic? Uh, at first, it was 
like an image and a sound who fascinated me. And then I became interested in history and the background who, who involved this character. And, and the, this image and this sound was a very particular uh, thing. It was um, like the poor means of a, of a resistant man, a resistance man. And he, he did the sabotage uh, with, a, with a very uh, small saw against the electric pylons of the woods in Catalonia. So this kind of resistance, so, so poor and, and so, uh, and, and then the abandonment of, the, of a young, of, a, of an old man in the woods was what um, attracted me to the history. Yeah, it's true because we're normally used to uh, movies that show resistance in a collective ways. And so why did you choose to uh, this character who is really loneliness? And uh, I mean, his loneliness is obvious. Yeah, uh, I, I liked it um, most, most than his loneliness because um, uh, he was uh, he was unpopular. I mean, the, this kind of people in in, in my country, uh, most of them they are like heroes or uh, like Robin Hood, more or less. So, and this one when when I did the research, uh, the people in the villages. Uh, like half of them said me that he was a very nice person and the other ones said me that he was like a son of a, this thing. I don't know if I can say it on TV, but, but it was like that. So, um, so I was interested because I, I, I never, I never like, like stories of very good ones and very bad ones or bad, bad guys. And, and this ambiguity, I, I like to, to face history and face uh, a recent, uh, my recent history. Okay, and you don't give a lot of uh, historical uh, details or information in this movie. Uh, is it because maybe you wanted to create a, like a timeless character? Yes, it's, it's because of that and also because what made me uh, be interested and fascinated with, by history was not a, a book or a, or a very developed character with all the dates and chronological history, but, but an atmosphere or a... Or a or a doubt. So, so what I what I want to to show to people is is this fascination that that attracted me, and and I think it's better if you if you feel fascinated by uh, by some images and sounds, and and I give small clues about history, and then th these people can can do a research a research by themselves, and then and they can judge uh, history and those people by themselves also. Okay, and uh, what would be your future projects? It's, it has nothing to do with, with history or with, uh, with this kind of, of film. Well, I don't know, because it's, it's been... I mean, I, I started writing it like one month ago, so I don't know what, what's going to happen. But uh, it will happen in, in the beach, like the, <laughs> the months. Nothing uh, linked to uh, the former. No, I don't think so. M maybe, maybe in three months I, I'm I'm doing something different. But now uh, I'm I'm doing like a story of a family of tourists after uh, the summer who have to stay in a in a small town and and like the the relationship with the local um, villagers in the town in a relationship uh, very hostile and I don't know. Okay, thank you. So you made a feature film about resistance during the 50s mm -hmm. under Franco's regime. And uh, here the documentaries of our guests, uh, Magda Vistu and Michael Madsen, also deal with resistance uh, to opinion, but in various ways. So but does each of you see his or her movie as an act of resistance? Of so course, but I, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, watch it. You can grab. Ah, uh, oh, you have your micro. I have uh, my mic. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately couldn't see it yet, so I can't really. Uh, I mean, anything. do you see your movie ah, as an act okay. of resistance? Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's about uh, yeah lesbians and their strategies in Poland against homophobia. So it's uh, yeah a resistance film, a, a mov film about a movement of resistance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Louis? My film? Yes, but um, more than the film itself that talks about resistance and surviving, I think uh, having made this movie is also an act of, re of resistance because the, the way to do it uh, with uh, very young people uh, who was the first time who, who was facing a, a 
feature film. And also trying to, to, found, to fund, fund it, I mean, to, to get uh, funding, uh, was very, um, very alternative way because we, we couldn't go to, to traditional um, organizations to, to get funding because we, we were nobody, so nobody would give us money. And, and then we, we did like a very, very small fundings of uh, non-profit organizations. So then we, we made the film like this, I mean, like a very transversal and, and very participative with uh, a lot of institutions. Okay, Michael, do you see your movie as an act of resistance? No, I don't. Um, it, Into Eternity is not made as a resistance film, but I would like to think that the film makes it more difficult for any audience to resist thinking because sometimes I believe that um, qualified questions are much more interesting than answers and uh, the questions that is in into eternity in relationship to nuclear waste and what to do with it whether or not to warn the future if that's possible at all uh, I think these are questions that is something that we all have to, in a way, deal with because it's our time that um, has the benefit of nuclear energy. So even if you actually are against nuclear energy, it won't in itself make the nuclear waste go away. It's already here. So hopefully it'll make people think. Okay, so I would like to switch back to you, Magda. Um, as we already mentioned, your movie is about the lesbian scene in Poland. And we would like now to see a short expert excerpt of the movie, please. Okay, Magda, um, now we have seen the excerpt, and I would like to know what were your intentions of doing this movie? Yes, as you said, it's about uh, the situation of lesbians in Poland, and actually it's about the lack of visibility of les lesbians, because um, there are um, a couple of films about um, homosexuals or LGBT people in uh, Poland, but actually most of them are uh, dealing with uh, gay men, and lesbians are um, invisible in that, and so this is actually the first um, documentary explicitly uh, about lesbians. So this is point one. And uh, second, um, I wanted to have another perspective on Poland and homophobia on, in Poland, because if you, in Germany at least, uh, talk about uh, Poland, then everyone is like, oh, it's so bad in this middle-aged country or whatever. And uh, we, of course, are um, very um, progressive already here in Germany and everything changed and and that's not true and I wanted uh, to have a to try to have a new perspective on that that um, of course it is hard and people have to be tough to resist uh, there but um, there are <coughs> many many um, groups and activities um, and I wanted to show that and <coughs> at the end the public public has to judge if I managed to have a new perspective on that but yeah, and I wanted to empower um, lesbians um, to come out <laughs> because uh, you have to know that there are only two um, persons of uh, public persons uh, who are out. So, yeah. Okay. Um, in your movie, you are not only <coughs> criticizing um, the the homophobic uh, society in Poland, but you are generally criticizing um, the Polish society. Maybe you could tell us something about it. Well, the um, Polish society is very um, much influenced by the Catholic Church. <laughs> Maybe it's similar in Spain, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you have uh, you know, an, a norm how you have to 
look like, um, how you have to behave, um, about the roles, how, how a man has to be, how, to, how a woman has to be, and, and no one really questions that. And um, this is not only, um, as you said, it doesn't, um, um, it's not only about lesbians uh, that they have a hard, hard time in this society, but like everyone who tries to live a different, an, uh, an alternative to this uh, norm uh, has a really hard life, even in, I don't know, uh, alternative subcultures. Um, there are only a few people who uh, have the strength to say, okay, I'm not marrying, for example, or yeah, to live in another way. And how do you think the Polish audience will react on that? Well, that's interesting. I, I'm, the film is uh, just now finished and I'm uh, sending it to festivals and the first Polish festival uh, didn't want it, <laughs> so I will see what will happen. Um, I don't know, maybe they just didn't like it, but maybe it was also too critical um, for that. I don't know. I will see. But why is it the lesbians get less public attention than a gay man? This is not a, a typical Polish phenomenon. It's, uh, I think it's uh, global. Uh, we live in a patriarchal um, society, and of course, uh, that you have to just to, to uh, look back in the 60s or 70s when the LGBT movement um, started uh, in the US or in Germany or in other countries. Uh, that was the same. Um, that was the Gay Liberation uh, Liberation Front first, and then. Um, women said, hey, um, but what, uh, we have different topics and uh, we don't see us there in this movement and they split. And there were all these uh, fights um, has, have taken place uh, in other countries as well. So this is just maybe later in Poland, but it's the same in the whole world. Okay, so um, do you think that maybe your film can change, in po even in Poland, something? Or do you hope that? That's a hard question. I don't know. Um, I, I hope that, like, you hope that uh, your film will um, do something with the people who watch that. Um, I hope it will first empower um, people to, to change their lives or to be maybe more um, uh, conscious about what they do. Um, yeah. And my last question is. Um, uh, what do you think for the future? I mean, are you planning anything, even maybe a feature film or something? Uh, I'm not really into feature films. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have plenty of uh, new projects in my mind. I don't, I don't actually know which one I will choose, but there's um, one, uh, it's dealing again with Poland, but uh, a completely other topic. I wanted to um, maybe make a documentary about uh, Jewish people in Poland who uh, don't know if they are Jewish or not, because maybe they were, uh, there are lots of people like that um, who were, for example, adopted by a Polish family and are now, I don't know, 60, 70 years old and um, try to find out about their identity. That was one of the ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go back to Into Eternity. So this documentary deals the, with the issue of nuclear waste and specifically with the world's first permanent storage of uh, radioactivity waste. And uh, we're going to watch the excerpt now. I am now in this place where you should never come. We call it Onkelo. Onkelo means hiding place. In my time it is still unfinished, though work began in the 20th century, when I was just a child. Work would be completed in the 22nd century, long after my death. Onkelo must last 100,000 years. Nothing built by man has lasted even a tenth of that time span. But we consider ourselves a very potent civilization. If we succeed, Onkelo will most likely be the longest lasting remains of our civilization. If you sometime find to the future find this, what would it tell you about us? 
Your documentary is really interesting regarding to uh, the latest uh, event in uh, Japan. And um, as you almost answered um, before uh, this question, but what do you really want to achieve with this movie? I think that the most significant element of nuclear waste, apart from it being extremely toxic, is the time span that is involved. And because we are talking about 100,000 years, or if it wasn't the US who, say, who has the same type of waste, it would be a million years, but in Finland it's said to only be 100,000 years. I don't know why. But this time span is, I believe, the true problem of nuclear waste, because it's, in my mind, it's incomprehensible. I don't understand what 100,000 years is, yet the engineers who are trying to build this facility in a foolproof manner, they of course will have to have some ideas about what does the future looks, look like in 100,000 years. Um, so on the one hand you have nuclear energy as the epitome of human technological achievement, a deep insight into the universe, and then you have the waste product, which has this time span that uh, perhaps exceeds our comprehension, uh, and, and therefore you can say, in a, in a way, creates a kind of a black hole in our understanding, and therefore, of course, also um, possibly in our ability to act responsibly towards the future. So you want to people to think about it with your documentary. You want to make people really realize what are our nuclear waste. I think that uh, the reason why the engineers working with projects like this prefer to talk about the technological aspects, like how deep is the hole in the ground and so on, uh, that reflects that, uh, that the time span is so difficult to talk about, so difficult to, to understand, uh, but that is the real problem and that is something that I believe uh, any public is not actually aware, about, uh, aware of, that that is a part of nuclear energy, that time span. Okay, and you're presenting um, the, 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 this uh, topic in a very dramatic way. And uh, why did you choose uh, this, this way of representing? Was it a strategy or...? I don't know if it's a dramatic, w dramatic way, but it's, it's designed as a kind of message to the future. Because the basic design element in any such facility is that it, it should be able to operate beyond the point of any knowledge. That's because in this time span, the engineers expect that civilization, as we know today, that a studio like this will simply cease to exist and so will the knowledge about what is nuclear waste and why is it dangerous. The problem about radiation, as we now know from Japan very clearly, is that you cannot sense it in any way. You cannot smell it. You don't know if you're exposed to radiation unless you're extremely close to it. Um, so, uh, the film plays with the idea that a visitor from beyond the point of knowing about today somehow is able to come back and film today um, so that perhaps the audience will experience to watch a kind of science fiction documentary uh, as if the audience was transported into the future looking back, back at our time. And ultimately my interest in this facility in Finland um, and making this film has been to look at nuclear waste as a phenomenon because it is the first time in human history that we are building perhaps even the first post-human structure. The only other buildings that we can compare this facility with that has to last for 100,000 years would be the pyramids or the cathedrals. But they were all built in a religious context and this is not the case for this um, also monument, you can say. That's an interesting difference. Well, exactly. It leads to my next question, actually. Because do you think uh, that people in the future uh, would consider Ankalo as like a treasure or, as you were saying, the pyramids or not, and why? Well, this is something that the experts in the film, they, they think about. And of course, it's possible too that it would be interpreted as a kind of religious burial site, which is what we normally tend to understand things that we find 
from the past and which we cannot totally understand uh, or decipher. Um, but the interesting thing is that if this facility is ever rediscovered, it will be a purely rational construction. There will be no science left because, as it is today, the preferred strategy in Finland is to hide it. Because in that way, you can uh, get around human curiosity, which is probably the, the biggest threat to a facility like this. But then you're actually trying to fight human nature. Okay, the next question is um, for you all. And um, it's like, what would you tell people um, uh, or, or who would hear your message in 100,000 years? What would you tell them? In 100,000 years, what would you tell them? Well, I can start by saying that uh, an, an interesting um, fact, and that is that in, in Sweden, who are collaborating with Finland on a similar, the, the same concept, for nuclear waste. In the, f in the Swedish law, it is stated that um, the waste should be kept uh, safe from all living creatures. It doesn't talk about human beings in this time span, but living creatures. So perhaps it not, it's not people like us who will, if possible, be watching our films in 100,000 years. Okay, but what would you tell those creatures, if you can? Please. All of you, maybe Magda, what would you tell them? Well, it's a funny question, or a nice question. Um, I don't know, maybe I would tell um, 100,000 years ago there were all these categories like gender, race, and all this other shitty stuff, sorry. <laughs> and uh, now we uh, don't have that anymore, and yeah, that was a long time ago, maybe like that. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, Luis? Uh, I've been thinking, but I, <laughs> I cannot imagine. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Were well, I, I'm a little bit scared movies? because with, with this kind of technology, our movie, we, we didn't print it in 35 millimeters, so it's <laughs> like a digital <laughs> thing. So maybe in 20 years it doesn't exist, so <laughs> maybe there's no more my movie in, in so years. I don't know. I have to earn money, money to, to print the, the film. Okay, so thanks a lot for coming today and doing this interview with us. And now I would thank our audience for watching this show. It was a pleasure. And now I would like to give a hint on the next report, which is about the night side and about the film Kidnapped. Thank you. Oh my god. I'm here to reporting for the Crossing Film Festival. Maybe it's my last tape. I'm going to watch the film Kidnapped. I hope you will enjoy it. I really hope you will enjoy it. Thank you for giving me this interview. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Of course. Um, my name is Markus Koschnik. I'm uh, actually from the Tyrol, but I moved to Vienna 10 years ago and there I started working as a film critic, travel ar traveling around to um, lots of different festivals, Cannes, Berlin, Venice, but also smaller ones. Um, and I've always been very interested in genre cinema, in horror cinema. I grew up with it. This was basically my passion from the early, you know, early years. I'm kind of this videotech child. I was um, dumped by my parents, not really dumped, but, you know, each weekend I was allowed to go to the local video store mm -hmm. and rent four, uh, four videos over the yeah. weekend. And at first it was kind, kind of children's animation films, but then it um, was horror, horror, horror movies. movies. Yes. And what's the defi definition for you for, of a good horror movie? It has to get me emotionally. I have to feel something. That's something that I'm always looking, um, no matter what kind of movie that I'm watching, um, it has to do something to me. It has to tell me a story, it has to connect with me. And on, on which level um, uh, it achieves that, uh, it depends. So right now we just see a good movie, a kidnapped. Can you tell us a little bit more about this horror movie, the story and the emotion that they bring to the audience? Yes, uh, Sequestrados is a film by Miguel Ángel Vivas. He's a um, Spanish director. It's his uh, second film. Um, he's a very slow-paced director, actually. His um, previous one uh, was in 2002, so it took almost 10 years uh, to, to do another film. I think you've all seen it, or you can see it, because it's really um, stylistically perfect and very well-crafted, so it takes his time. <laughs> Para, 
para. ¿Qué haces? Pa para. I picked this movie because I think it's um, highly indicative of a very um, um, of a very colorful and a very vibrant genre film culture in Spain. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's based in in and around Catalonia. There is a company like Filmex. Uh, they are very big. Um, they have lots of money. Um, and uh, movies like Rec, for yes. example, from uh, four years ago, we opened actually um, the first Nachtsicht, the first Night Sight. Mm -hmm. uh, my program here, the very first one we opened, the very first movie of the Nachtsicht was Rec. Yes. Um, and I've seen this one in Sieges. In Sieges, uh, there is an annual uh, horror film festival, fantasy film festival, um, in um, early October. Um, and I've seen this movie there. And I just sat in there and um, it totally blew me away. I think this is a movie that's really operating on a very basic level. You know, you just are thrown into the situation and you have to live through it. And I think this connects with your fears, um, subliminal fears, but also very overt fears. Um, and that's actually what genre cinema um, is about. New Gender in Spain, you are quite famous for the terror movie. Can you give us a quick definition of what is a good terror horror movie or terror movie? Well, I mean, I think the terror movies are uh, firmly rooted um, in human fears. Um, they stem from society, they stem just actually from living together. They are everyday fears. Um, and we can also see it in politics. There are the fear mongers amongst politicians who kind of feed on the fears. And I think those movies, um, to get you to kind of um, have a dialogue, you know, with your fear, mm. to understand yourself. Why why am I afraid? I think this is basically the question that you're asking yourself when you walk out of this movie. And why, why are was you I afraid? afraid? <laughs> of course, because something like this, we all know it, it can happen. You can have mm -hmm. the safest house everywhere, but it can happen because um, it's based on circumstance, it's based on bad fortune. It can happen, mm -hmm. hopefully it never will, but um, I think it's cathartic to kind of uh, see this and um, connect with this. It was awesome. It was awesome. Really amazing, yeah. Especially okay. the end and the split screen. It was really impressive. Okay, so you think it's a good movie at the end? It is, yeah. Okay. I hope it comes to the big screen. It's a shame of a movie. It's too bloody, too splatter, too everything. I think I need to go to the concert maybe to get like relaxed again because it was too hard. Hello again, I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for watching and join us again tomorrow from 8 p.m.